We're going to continue our journey into gradient free methods today, talking about a genetic algorithm. This is a popular and pretty well known method um, for gradient free optimization. Uh, this will actually be a two part thing. We're going to talk about uh, the binary form, and then next time we'll talk about the, the real valued version that allows for continuous, um, more continuous design variables. Okay, so um, genetic algorithms, as the name implies, are inspired by the biological process of evolution uh, using the ideas from genetics. There are three kind of key ideas that are involved in all genetic algorithms. And I should say genetic algorithms are a, uh, a subset of a wider class of methods called evolutionary algorithms. And there, even within genetic algorithms, there's a wide variety because we use heuristics, but there are the three main ideas. First is selection. And uh, this is the idea uh, from evolution of survival of the fittest. So this is where most of the improvement in the population or in the design is gonna come from. Um, we don't have the idea of a descent direction like we even did in Elder Mead and of course in gradient base. But here the idea is that we're gonna have the better designs survive, uh, less fit designs not continue. Um, and then over time, the population will improve. Okay, and then crossover, it's kind of the second idea. And this is meant to, uh, this is inspired by the, uh, biological process of reproduction. So that we'll have a new generation. And then finally, a mutation meant to represent sort of natural variation. Okay, so those are kind of the three main principles. Um, as far as characteristics of the algorithm, uh, these one big difference compared to the ones that we've uh, seen so far is that it's stochastic. So certainly uh, gradient-based was not, and, and even the Nelder Mead was not, but uh, a, a genetic algorithm involves randomness. We use random numbers throughout the method and that's kind of uh, inherent to the approach. It allows for the robustness um, and variability, but it means that you're gonna get a different result every time. So every time you run the genetic algorithm, you'll get a different answer. And often you will need to, or want to run it multiple times because the answer you may you get may not be so great. Um, it's not gonna really converge in the sense that we're maybe used to. It's gonna you know, terminate after, usually after some number of generations. And so often we need to run it a, a few times at least to, to kind of see some different answers and get a good solution. If you need um, reproducibility, you can, you can set a random seed. So uh, you know, every programming language has ability to set a seed so that when you generate these pseudo random numbers, you'll still get that same sequence of random numbers um, for reproducibility. Uh, the method is population-based. So this is even more beyond, so with Nelder Mead, we saw that we had multiple points, right? Uh, that we kind of evolved in this tetrahedron. Well, we're gonna go even beyond that and have a population, even more points. Um, so let's say hundreds of points potentially. Uh, this helps for exploration. You know, we can explore more of the space, although of course the trade-off is, is gonna be more expensive evaluating the function at more places. It has a real um, or a binary version. Uh, that's nice because with the binary, and we call this binary encoding, um, we can handle discrete variables. It's not necessarily the most efficient approach. We're actually gonna have a whole chapter on discrete variables, but uh, it provides an option for us um, if we, uh, for problems that have, let's say, mixed or discrete variables. Um, and it's uh, heuristic. That's not how you spell. Heuristic. Uh, so, somewhat like the Nelder Mead, right? Although there's even more variations possible here. Um, throughout those different processes of selection, crossover, mutation, a lot of different options one could use. Um, and these are heuristic, so uh, some things tend to work better than others, but uh, there's a lot of variation and, and you know, no real guarantee of what's gonna be best. So there's a lot of tuning and exploration that's uh, maybe needed when you, when you use a genetic algorithm. Uh, I would say as just sort of a general characteristic compared to some other ones we've used, um, genetic algorithms <clears throat> like the biological process that it mimics is uh, 
uh, I guess is the pro and con, it's slow to adapt. Um, that means it's gonna take longer generally, but it's uh, also more robust. So just like as a uh, ad advantage occurs within the design space in the population, um, it's not gonna to try to quickly converge towards that. The population doesn't converge towards that and stagnate early. It's gonna still slowly move and adopt maybe some of these good features, but slowly so that maybe other uh, good designs can emerge. And so, like I said, this helps it be robust um, and not stagnate too early, but it also means that it's uh, you know slow. It's a slow process. Okay, so um, let's just get into some terminology here. Uh, each design variable, um, so let's say X1 here represents the, the height of some object, and we're gonna encode this in a gene. In this case, we're going to be using binary numbers, so we have some sort of encoding. But you know, for real variables next time, it's just just the regular number. But we combine all of these design variables into what we call a chromosome, um, and so this chromosome represents an entire design, right? This would be what we're used to thinking of as, as say, a starting point or a set of design variables. Um, but the difference here in genetic algorithm is we'll have many of them, um, and the set of them we call the population. So there are many members of this population, each one is a separate design. This entire population gets evolved into a new population and we call that a generation. Um, yeah, so, well, let me just illustrate this first and I'll mention what I was gonna say there. So here's a, a diagram of those three main processes that we talked about. At some given iteration K, we have a population and here say depicting in 2D would be a visual representation of the population, all different design points um, through selection or that um, survival of fittest. Some will not uh, carry on to the next population and others who are more fit or at least probabilistically, it's not that we guarantee the most fittest will choose or, or, or well, we'll see. Um, it's more likely that the fitter will survive and these will become the parents of the next generation. Then we have that crossover reproductive phase uh, where we'll produce offspring. And in most genetic algorithms, though not all, right, um, we preserve the population. So there'll be two parents that preserve two offspring. There are variations. Um, and sometimes it's not actually even just the two offspring that survive. Sometimes it'll be the best of those four, right, of those two parents and two offspring. But in most, the population stays the same size. So if we had 100 members of this population, um, after this reproductive phase crossover, we'll stay with 100. So every generation will always you know, stay the same size. Then there's this mutation phase where some of these genes may with some small probability mutate and that helps to uh, introduce some variability. And then this will continue. And there's not generally, it's hard to converge rigorously as we would in a gradient base. So a typical convergence is really just um, a fixed number of generations. We may specify that we'll run this for 50 generations or whatever, and we'll just repeat this process. Uh, sometimes we'll have a manual intervention where we'll just watch uh, the, say, fitness or the function values and, and uh, watch for some stagnation and, and terminate at some point. So uh, those are, it's harder to define. So there are ways to look for, say, um, the best member in the population isn't changing for X number of generations or things like that, but, um, you know, or, or within some tolerance, but we're not going to have really um, strong convergence criteria. Many of them, like I said, just use a fixed number of generations. Okay, so uh, I'm going to illustrate the um, process through an example. And this is an example uh, from one of Deb's books. Um, and here's a really simple thing. It's, uh, it's uh, meant to mimic a can. So let's say I've got uh, like a tin can, right? So it's a cylinder here. And it has just two design variables, a height and a diameter. Okay, and so let's say I wanna minimize the total amount of material. So this is um, the area, the top and bottom, and then the area of the side, I'll add it together. So then, you know, I'd, multiply that by some cost of material or whatever, uh, you know, to get some, you know, it's just to get some cost. So this is really just some surrogate for cost. I'm just trying to minimize how much material I use subject to a constraint that uh, this is the volume of this can. I need to hold some amount of, of whatever this is. And then I may have some geometric constraints for shipping or whatever, fairly basic uh, 
two-dimensional problem, but easy to kind of make some visuals out of. Okay, so the first step is we need to create an initial population, um, but actually before that, uh, I'm going to discuss the idea of encoding. Um, so let's do a very simple one. Um, let's say I had a uh, can here and had a diameter of eight, a height of 10. So I need to encode this into binary numbers. We're not actually gonna go all the way. So in genetics, right, we have, or is it A, G, C, T? I think that's right, right? So there's a set of four possibilities for each gene. We're gonna use binary numbers. So there's just two possibilities, right? A zero or one. Um, that's very natural for a computer anyway, right? Cause it's gonna be using binary. Um, so we're, we're gonna use the same kind of representation. So actually what I'm gonna do first is just use um, a regular binary notation, but we'll kind of generalize this a little bit. So if I wanted to represent the number eight in binary, uh, this would be a good time for you to try this. So pause and see if you can remember or, or you know, look this up, figure out how to do this. Um, try to write the number eight in binary and the number 10 in binary, and then come back and we'll compare notes here. Um, so eight in binary is actually gonna be uh, this number, zero, 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 one, and then you know some arbitrary number of zeros ahead of it. But let's just say I'm gonna use five numbers. I'm gonna have five bits. So that would be eight, okay? And the way this works is that uh, this would be, let's say at the two to the zero spot, right? So um, two to the zero is one, of course. So if I had a one here, that means I add one to my number. And if I have a zero here, I, I don't do anything with that spot. So if I had one bit, right, if get rid of all these, if I had just this one bit, that means I can represent the number zero or one, right? That's it, that's kind of boring. All right? so I go to the next spot. That's the two to the one spot, right? So this means two to the one is two. So putting zero here, of course, does nothing. Putting a one here means I have two. I had two to the problem. So if I had only those, these two numbers here, right? If I had um, zero, zero, it's all zeros. If I have zero, one, that equals one. If I have one zero, this is now two. And I have one one, this is now three, right? Because this is um, two to the one plus two to the zero. So two plus one is three, okay? So moving on, right? This is my two to the two, two to the three, two to the four, and so on. So in this case, two to the three is eight. So that represents, that gives me eight, right? So in other words, and we could say this is zero times two to the four plus one times two to the three plus zero times two to the two plus zero, blah, blah, blah. These are all zeros. So I get two to the three, that's eight. So uh, if you didn't get that, try pause and try to get 10. Um, so that's gonna be zero times two to the fourth plus, here's my three, five spots here, plus one times two to the three, that gives me eight. And I just need to add two more. So that's gonna give me a one here. So they're all gonna be zero. All right, so um, I could represent this as the gene for my diameter. This is the gene for my height, just some binary number. Um, and uh, if I wanted to write this, you know, more generally, so well, well, let me say a few problems here. One is I'm only using five bits, right? So what's the largest number I can possibly represent here? Well, that's going to be if I have one, 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 and that number ends up being 31. So it would be um, two to the fifth, which is the next number, which I can't quite get, right? This would, the next possible number after the five ones would be one, zero, 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 zero. That'd be two to the fifth. So one after that. So it's, so it's two to the fifth minus one is the largest number I can represent, which is 31. So with these five bits, I can represent numbers from zero to 31 and that's it. Um, I also only have a resolution of a delta X of one. Right, I can represent number one, number two, number three, number four, but I can't have a diameter that's 3.3, .3, for example, um, with this representation. Now I can do all of those things, but to do it is gonna require more bits. Um, I can get bigger numbers with more bits, I can get more resolution with more bits, and if I want bigger numbers and more resolution, I need even more bits. Um, so that's just gonna limit, uh, you know, the, my complexity here and, and the, the, the storage of numbers I need to do. But as a formula, we could, do, we could write it like this, that the resolution I'm gonna get is gonna be uh, the biggest number I wanna represent 
minus the smallest number I want to represent divided by 2m minus 1, where m here, uh, that is the number of bits. So in our example, the biggest number I could do was 31. The smallest number I wanted to do was 1. And I had 5 bits. So that's 2 to the 5th minus 1. 2 to the 5th two to the fifth is 32, right? So the bottom is 31. Um, Oh yeah. No, no, sorry. The small, I was gonna say that doesn't quite make sense. The smallest number I could do is zero, right? I could do all five zeros. Okay, that makes more sense. So I get 31, I didn't erase 31, divided by 31. So my delta X is one in this case, which wasn't too surprising. Um, I could pick other delta Xs and this will tell me what I need to do. So um, I could either, choose a delta x I want, right? And then solve for the number of bits or vice versa, um, or delta x and the number of bits and solve for what the biggest number I could do. Anyway, I, I could pick any one of these and solve for another. Um, but this tells me kind of the relationship. And then if I wanted to go backwards, if I want to take this number and get uh, an x value out, the formula is going to be like as follows. x is going to be my smallest number. Uh, the bar is going to be the smallest underneath. Um, plus, sorry, I, I don't know if I described this notation. So X underneath, that means the smallest number I can represent. When I put the bar above, that's the biggest number I can represent. So let's see, I from zero to M minus one, um, BI to I. So BI here is just, uh, it's the bit. It's either a zero or a one. So we're just gonna iterate through each of these bits. So this is exactly the process that we just did here, right? I take the bit, I look at bit number, uh, I start with this first bit. Is that a zero or one? I plug that in there and then I multiply it by two to the I, right? So I start with zero, I go two to the one, right? B I times two to the I plus B one times two to the one plus B two times two to the two, right? And then to make this more general, I now multiply by my width. Before we were doing the case, which is gonna be normal for just regular binary numbers where delta X is one but I could make delta X anything. So let's say just an example, delta X was 0.5. Everything I did would work just fine, except for I'd multiply through by 0.5. So my range of numbers would go from zero to um, whatever, let's see, 31 divided by two is 15 and a half, I guess. Um, so this number here would actually be four, this number would be five. So I would have had to you know, move everything up. So it's either gonna, it's gonna, I can get smaller resolution, but it tightened up my range here. Okay, so, I mean, this is important, you know, for the more general case, but let's just stick with the simpler case for now. We're just gonna stick with this regular binary. So here's my can. It's got this for the diameter and this for the height. Okay, so what do we do? We now combine them into one chromosome. So here's my chromosome. Um, I take my diameter, right? This was the diameter. And I take the height, uh, zero, one, zero, one, zero. I'm just gonna mash them together into this one big binary string here, right? Or bigger binary number. So this is my chromosome. And if I've got lots of variables, right? Just like we take a chromosome, we put together all these genes. Actually, I don't really know how it works, something like that, right? But uh, we do the same thing here with this big binary number. We take all our design variables and we just plug them all in along some one big length. And it's kind of a very similar idea to um, some things in genetics in that these numbers encode something about the design. So let's think about uh, this case here. If I take this first bit and flip it, what does that physically mean? Well, what does it mean if there's a zero here? That means that my diameter could range between a number from zero to the biggest it could be is 15. Whereas if this first number is one, that means the diameter is gonna be a number between 16 and 31. So you could say that this first bit here is like the gene that says whether I have a narrow can, a diameter between zero and 15, or a wider can, a diameter between 16 and 31. So in some sense, these bits here, these genes are encapsulating something about the design, right? Okay, so that's kind of the background of, of the chromosome thing. So um, first, first step, initial population. Okay, and let's think about the 2D problem here. Um, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna provide some bounds. Uh, 
actually, I'm just going to draw this as a square here. So let's say I only had two variables. Um, and x1, let's say it could vary between minus three and eight, and x2 can vary between uh, one and three, whatever. Okay, so I want to choose some initial points for my initial population. Um, we could do this randomly, and that's certainly an option that's done, but a better one is to do things that are, are still random, but are spread out in some sense, right? Because if it's purely random, I may cluster a lot, and I kind of want to span the space, um, a method that's commonly used, and we'll talk about later in the semester. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but you can certainly look it up or see it as an option in many of these methods is what's called Latin hypercube sampling. And like I said, we'll talk about the method later, but the idea is really that uh, it's an optimization problem actually, um, where we maximize kind of the spread between these points um, so that it's, a, it's more space filling. Okay. Uh, but uh, there are a few things that we need to note here. In gradient-based methods, we can make these bounds, like let's say x1, uh, well, let's actually just do numbers that make sense. For the example we were doing, diameter and height. And let's say these were things that were allowed based on whatever, manufacturing, and shipping and such. Um, if this was gradient-based, and let's say my Diameter, well, it's not really makes, doesn't make too much sense in this case, but let's say the diameter could be really big. I actually didn't really care how big it was. I could put this huge number and it wouldn't affect my algorithm at all, right? It's just something that's gonna check for a bound. Um, bounds are really important here, much more important here uh, for gradient free, because let's say I make this some big number like 80, it's gonna choose the initial population by that. And so I'm gonna have designs that are way out here. They're gonna be huge, maybe way bigger than I want. So I have to be careful to bound this problem tightly. If I know something like, well, you know, this is about where I think uh, my optimal design is gonna be. The more information I can provide, the better it's gonna be. Whereas in the gradient base, you know, making this really big provides no penalty at all. In fact, in many of the algorithms, we set it to be effectively infinity, right? Because it's not constrained in that, in that uh, parameter. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind is uh, paying more attention to making the bounds tighter um, if you can. Um, another is that uh, we need the population to be pretty big uh, because uh, if it's too small, you know, there's not enough diversity in the population and it's not going to be able to explore very well and it'll stagnate too early. So as a rule of thumb, and you know, this is just a rule of thumb, it's usually, let's say about an order of magnitude larger than the number of design points. So if I have just two design variables here, then probably initial population of at least 20 is about where I want. But you know that again takes some experimentation. It's not a hard and fast rule. Okay, so let's say I did that. I generated these initial cans and I'm gonna have a ridiculously small population here just for illustration, just six members of my population. So I randomly generated these six cans and uh, these are the fitness. So this is the surface area of that can, right? That's the thing I want to minimize. So 20 is better than 21, right? Because it's going to be cheaper. Um, these ones that have a plus behind them, these are ones that violated my constraint. Um, and so there are a few ways we could maybe handle it with some of the methods. There's no real direct way to handle constraints. So we have to add some penalty. So um, we can talk about penalties in a second, but let's just say, Let's just say that there's a penalty here, all right? So uh, this can, its surface area is really small, but it doesn't hold that volume that I want. Remember I had that volume constraint. So I added some penalty here. Um, actually, I'll just say one thing about the penalties right now. Um, so we, we already talked about penalty functions and those can be used. A common variation that's um, based on those is to add an additional penalty that makes sure that um, anything that's infeasible is always worse than anything that is feasible. So in other words, that penalty function, maybe the penalty was only five, but um, you know, it says 11 plus five. And then that might suggest that this can is actually better than these ones, uh, but we don't generally want that to occur. Um, you know, that's gonna be problematic because these are slower to evolve that we wanna kind of really push these designs that are feasible out a little bit quicker. So often we'll take the existing penalty function and then add an additional term onto it, which is basically like, let's add the objective of the worst member of the population, right? That, that could be one variant here is 37, or we could take the difference between that and the worst population. So we could say, 
let's take a, a difference here uh, between these two. So we know that adding whatever it is, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. Well, let's see, in this case, uh, I would have to add at least uh, 11, let's say, to make sure that, um, uh, no, no, I want it to be worse than the worst. So this is 37. So I'd have to add at least, uh, what is that? Uh, 28, yeah, I have to add at least 28, right? Plus whatever penalty term that I add. So uh, that's just one approach. Okay, um, let's now move to the next phase. So I've got my initial population. Now the next step was selection. It's that survival of the fittest. And there are a few approaches. The first one I'm gonna talk about is what's called a tournament. So here's what happens in the tournament. We are going to randomly um, assign these uh, members into pairs. So I'll pick one and I'll randomly pick another. Okay, and then I'll, and I'll take those two out and then I'll randomly, so let's say I randomly uh, chose this one and this one, and those are removed. And I'm gonna randomly pick another two and those are removed and then I randomly pick another two, okay? Uh, and then, then I do a tournament. So let's say this is what it looks like. I randomly pick these two and I do a tournament and the tournament just means I compare them and the best one wins. So in this case, 37 is less than 49, so the 37 wins. In these two, the 20 is less, so that one wins. In these two, the 21 is less, so that one wins. Okay, so that was round one of the tournament and I do it again. I randomly create pairs and do a tournament. So here's uh, uh, another random pair, 21 was better. Here's another random pair, 20 was better. Here's another random pair, 30 was better. So notice this is not good. So, so what's gonna happen here, you may, may have seen, is that um, we're guaranteed that the best member of the population, well, actually, let me back up. This approach means that every member of the population is gonna be copied in here either zero times, one time, or two times, okay? Um, and, uh, and it's not really that they're copied. We could say they're, they're gonna go to that next stage so they could um, reproduce zero, one, or two times. Um, You'll notice that the worst member of the population is guaranteed to be eliminated, and the best member of the population is guaranteed to appear twice because uh, everybody appears uh, participates in the tournament, but the best one is always going to win, right? So it's going to win here, and the second time we do the tournament, it's going to win there. So the best one will always appear twice. So here are the ones that are remaining for that next stage. So that would be the end of this selection process. Okay, so there they are. Those are the six that are going to move forward. Um, and they're now into uh, pairs, okay? Um, here's another approach. Actually, before we do that, let me describe another thing, an option here. This is a, uh, another variation of the tournament. Okay, so I said we could do these penalty functions and in some ways they're not super satisfying. Um, and most of the gradient-free methods uh, um, don't have a way to deal with constraints other than penalties. However, tournament selection can handle penalties. And not all the selection processes can, but tournament can. And the way we do it is this, is that we take two for a tournament, exactly the same way I, um, <coughs> I described it, but instead of using penalties, we do the following approach. We say one, we will prefer a feasible solution. So if one is feasible and one is infeasible, we choose the feasible, okay? Um, if both feasible, I'm just gonna shortcut here, uh, choose a better objective. So we'll choose the one for lower objective. So now they're both feasible, but now this one has a better objective. So we'll choose that one. Okay, and the other option is now that they're both infeasible. And so we'll choose the one with a less constraint violation. Okay, this is kind of like that filter method we talked about as an alternative in a line search. <clears throat> uh, and so this is a way that you can handle constraints that's maybe, um, maybe a bit more satisfying than just doing a, a penalty method. And this is, this is a, a nice approach for tournaments. Okay, here's a different approach. Um, it is also a selection process for that survival of the fittest, 
Um, but you cannot use, it doesn't, you can't use that same sort of filtering approach. We have to use a penalty. And it's called roulette wheel. And I'm not gonna go to the mathematics of it. It's in the, in the book. I just wanna talk about the idea. And the idea is that we take all the members of the population. So in this case, there's six, right? So I've got six little sectors here. So let's say there's, um, you know, there's X0, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. And um, we're gonna rank them proportionally to how good they are. So let's say X1 is the best member of the population, right? It's according to that fitness value. So I'm gonna give it a bigger slice of the pie. This is the best one. And let's say X5 here is the worst. These aren't in any order, right? I'm just, just randomly choosing here. And let's say X2 is the next worst, right? So the width of this pie here is based on its fitness. So I'd kind of take those fitnesses and normalize them so they'd add up to one and then give them each a segment corresponding to that. So in other words, if this design was like twice as good as another, it, it would have twice the width of another. And then what I do once I assign these widths is that I use a random generator. You know, you can think of it as spinning a wheel, um, a, a number between zero and one, and I'm just gonna randomly chick choose something in here. So I'm more likely to choose this. It doesn't mean I'm guaranteed to get this one, right? It's just more likely. And so I'm gonna spin the wheel, you know, six times or whatever and, and generate and do that selection process. Okay, so uh, next is the reproduction. So I've got um, these pairs at the end of, at the end of um, selection, I've got these pairs and now I'm gonna do reproduction. And let's say I have these two parents and one of them is zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero. I think that's the example we actually had, right? That was D is eight, H is 10. And then the other parent looks like this, uh, zero, one, one, um, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, okay? Um, these are parents. All right, so a uh, single point crossover, what we do here is that we're going to randomly generate a number, uh, uh, a separation point between these two, right? So it's, it's a lot like um, you know, these chromosomes where we take chromosomes and we're gonna sort of do this mixing and matching type of thing. So I randomly choose a separation point and let's say it's right here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm then going to combine the chromosomes, this part from this parent and this part from this parent. So the offspring are gonna look like this. And this is not exactly obvious like reproduction because we don't produce two at the same time here generally, unless, well, actually, I don't know how twins work, but okay. So uh, I shouldn't try to describe things I don't know. Okay, here, and then I go down to here. One, zero, 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 one, one, zero. And then the other offspring uh, is, the first part is the blue part, zero, one, one and then zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero. Okay, so produce two offspring there. This is called single point crossover. There's a lot of variations like two point crossover or end point crossover. We then split into other random segments and mix and match them in more ways. And off, sometimes we keep off the offspring, sometimes we keep the best of these four. Um, but you know, this is kind of the idea again, sort of inspired by uh, the ideas in genetics. Okay, uh, finally, the last step here is mutation. And so I've got this string here, uh, whatever it is. And what I do is that, uh, and I, it may be a different length, I was just writing a bunch of things, is that I'm going to visit each bit and with some small probability, which is usually like say a percent or two, I'm going to flip that bit. So in other words, I'm gonna go through this for loop and I'm gonna come to this first number here and I'm gonna pull out my random number generator. And if the number was say below, let's say 1% uh, is my threshold. If the number was below, so I'm gonna generate a number between zero, zero and one, and I get uh, 0.965. And I'd say, okay, that's above my threshold, which is 0.01. So I just move on to the next number. I don't do anything, right? And again, I don't do anything. And, and let's say I get over here and the random number I generate is 0.00. Three, and that was below my threshold of 1%. And of course, it's a, it's a floating point number, so it's got a bunch of digits, but 
it's now below there. So I said, okay, it met my threshold for flipping. And so I changed this to a one. And because my threshold is small, it should be small. You don't want mutation to be this thing where like, you know, it's a, it's, it's a high probability that everything is changing. That's not good for biology. It's also not good for your designs because it's more or less just devolving into a random search. But I do want some natural variation to occur. Um, it helps to, again, to encourage this diversity. And so uh, uh, probably is gonna be small, but some of these bits are gonna be flipped. All right, so that's the idea. It was a bit long today. So next time uh, we'll talk about a real version, a, a real encoding. So instead of using binary encoding, we'll just use the numbers, you know, like say 3.65, whatever, a, a real number. Um, that'll be a lot shorter because the me mechanics are gonna be much the same. There'll just be a few uh, differences to handle real numbers. So we'll, we'll talk about that next time.